Welcome to episode three of the Footy with Fletch podcast. I'm Fletch Fraser. And today's special guest is the fantastic Paul Roos. He's also affectionately known as Roosie. So uh, let's go through some of Paul Roos's highlights. He was, uh, his original team as a junior was at Beverly Hills. He played 269 games at Fitzroy, kicking 270 goals. Uh, He played 87 games at Sydney, kicking 19 goals. He uh, played a total of 356 games, kicking 289 goals. He played in the Victorian team for 14 games. Uh, representing Victoria. His career highlights include the Lee Matthews Trophy in 1986, the Fitzroy Captaincy from 1988 to 1990, and from 1992 to 1994. He was a five-time Mitchell Medal winner. He was the Fitzroy leading goal kicker in 1990, which was very much surprising. He was a seven- Time All-Australian in 1985, 1987, 1988, 1991, 1992, 1996 and 1970. He was a two-time All-Australian captain in 1991 and 1992. He was a two-time VFL team of the year in 1986 and 1987. He's in the Australian Football Hall of Fame, the Fitzroy team of the century uh, in the centre-half back position. He is also in the Fitzroy Hall of Fame. He has uh, had two EJ Whittam medals and the Victorian captaincy as well. So now let's go to his coaching career. He's coached 268 games, uh, 202 at the Swans with a win loss record of 116 wins, 84 losses and two draws. However, at the Melbourne Football Club, he coached them for 66 games uh, with a win record of 21-45-0. and zero. So, there you have it. Uh, Paul Roos also won the uh, Premiership in 2005 and was the All-Australian team coach in 2005. So, that was a great achievement for Paul Roos. He grew up in Donvale and played junior football with the Beverly Hills Football Club who uh, later in the interview, you will find out some other fantastic players that uh, got drafted and picked up from Beverly Hills. So thank you. Let's get into the podcast. Hello, Paul. How are you, mate? Thanks for having me. You going well? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. How are you? No, nah, thanks, mate. It's uh, exciting. Good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Uh, so how did you find growing up in the eastern suburb of Donvale? Yeah, mate, I was really lucky when I look back on it. It was a sort of new development area with uh, a lot of orchards and it was a fair way out of Melbourne back uh, back then. But the great thing about it, there's so many new sporting facilities and venues. Um, I was a member of the Donvale Tennis Club at an early age and then I joined the Beverly Hills Footy Club and went to the Ngunnawading Vikings Basketball Club and Ngunnawading Spectres rep team and... Uh, started at Donvale Primary School, which is a pretty new school, and then Donvale High School. So it's, look, it's a great area to live, really safe, out on my bike all the time, riding around to mates' places, spending a lot of time outdoors. And, yeah, no doubt it contributed to my uh, my footy skills and the fact that I was outside all the time. And it certainly contributed to my ability to get to, to Fitzroy and play in the under-19s. Yeah, no, it's a really good area uh, because my uh, mum grew up in East Doncaster, so she grew up in the same area as you. And, of course, you played at the Beverly Hills Football Club, which is a very well-known football club for having some great football talent. Yeah, it is. It's a, it is a good area. Um, and Beverly Hills, uh, I think before 
well, just when I was getting there, I think two players that went, one went to South Melbourne, Mark Browning, so he played at Beverly Hills, and then Chris Smith, who I went to play with at Fitzroy, so he was from Beverly Hills as well, and then since then, I think Christian Petrarca, uh, Mark Murphy, there's quite a few other guys as well, and even Ben Simmons, who is in the NBA, obviously playing over uh, for the Philadelphia 76ers, so he played at the Beverly Hills Footy Club as well, so yeah, it's got a good history of producing um, some AFL players. Yeah, it definitely does. So, which team did you grow up supporting and who was your biggest idol? Yeah, look, I grew up a Carlton supporter, actually. So, I didn't go to the football much because I was sort of playing a lot of sport on the weekends. But I'd watch, in those days, Carlton featured a lot on the, the Saturday night replay. So, they were on a lot. Um, so, I watched a lot of their games, you know, mainly the one quarter they played back then. And I had Barry Armstrong's number on the jumper. So, he was a, an early uh, contemporary Carlton player in the 70s. And then I went to the, remember going to the 79 grand final to watch Carlton Collingwood the year before I went down to Fitzroy under 19. So, I was fortunate to go to that grand final and watch the Blues win it. And uh, it was great to sort of finish off my Carlton um, barracking days before I went to Fitzroy with a premiership. So that was exciting as well. Yeah, no, Carlton are a good club. Do you still have a feeling of support for the Blues? No, not really. It's funny. And even some of my friends who are barrack for other clubs, I think when you get involved in a football club, you know, you have obviously your heart and soul of that club so as soon as I went down to Fitzroy you know you're just immersed in the footy club and even a lot of my friends once I started playing with Fitzroy they they sort of started barracking for Fitzroy because they had a link to the footy club and then I left Fitzroy went to Sydney and then left Sydney went to Melbourne so when you're involved in the industry you, you know you don't really support that club you support as a kid um, you know you're really immersed in the footy club that you're involved in at the time. Yeah, because that uh, is your day-to-day -day job. So what was a week in the life of Paul Roos like when you were a coach, player and a commentator? Yeah, so as a player, when I first started as a player, we worked as well. So when I look back, it was a super busy week. I mean, I, my first job was with the AMP. And so pre-season, we'd have to go down to Kerford Road in South Melbourne in the morning. So three mornings a week. So... I'd get up really early, travel in from my home out in the eastern suburbs, train, head into AMP, which was in the city, then go back to training at the Junction Oval afterwards. So it was a really, really long day. Um, then I started playing at Sydney when I left Fitzroy, and I sort of was full-time then. So it was a little bit more manageable as the players are now, where you're, you're not working, you're actually just doing your full-time job. And then when I was a coach, I was really lucky to coach in an era of full-time players. So, yeah, we, we basically did a... A, a proper job so we you know get into the office at sort of 7 30 and do our meetings and training and then most days we'd sort of leave by you know five o'clock in the afternoon and then you know you had the ability with the computers to do your coding at home and watch your um watch a lot of games at home as well sort of thing so yeah it's it's changed a lot over the years from when i first started playing it's like you're working a nine to five job rosie so uh, have you missed working in the footy industry? Um, you miss the camaraderie of the team and you miss um, winning. You know, winning's great. And, you know, it's very hard to duplicate when you get a group of players together that all want to play for the same cause. And, you know, you all have high standards and you all work together. I mean, that's the essence of sort of teamwork. And when you walk off the field of battle and you've won and won a really hard game, it, yeah, that's part of it you miss. There's other parts you don't miss. But... Certainly the winning and the camaraderie and the teamwork and all the things that go with it, you definitely miss that. Teamwork sure is an important part of footy, Rosie. Did you have any match day superstitions that you used to prepare for uh, on the day of an AFL game? Yeah, look, when I was a player, I was quite superstitious. And when I first started playing, all that games were on Saturday at 2.10. So I remember I'd go to bed every um, Friday night at the same time and I'd get up every Saturday morning at the same time. And then I'd have eight pieces of Vegemite on toast every single Saturday morning. Um, obviously that changed a little bit and I passed on a Friday night. So when, you know, games changed a bit, when I started to become a coach, you know, the, the routine changed. But, you know, sitting on the same seat in the bus, you know, with a lot of players are really superstitious around that. Uh, what you eat the night before the game, players are superstitious around that. What you eat the day of the game, players are superstitious around that. So yeah, most, most players and coaches have a lot of 
you know, certain superstitions that they follow and they try and do it religiously week in, week out. Do you think those superstitions affected how you played? Um, I think it's more your own mind and just your preparation, you know, getting your own preparation right, right and what you think works. Um, so if you feel good about yourself and you feel good about your mind and it's a bit about routine, you know, players are very good at getting into a routine and sticking to a routine. And if you get thrown out of your routine and, you know, that can sort of throw your game out. So, yeah, I think it does help because you just feel comfortable going into games and you feel like you've ticked all the boxes and you're ready to play. Yeah, that's fantastic. Routines are really important. At the end of the 1990s season, you received a phone call when you were away and you nearly got traded to Collingwood. How did you take this? Yeah, it was really hard. It was, um, I was overseas and I got a phone call from a manager that they said, oh, you need to take a 30% pay cut or they're going to trade you or cut you. And I was like, I was captain at the time. And yeah, it was a bit of a shock um, to get that phone call. And I didn't ever get a phone call from anyone at Fitzroy, which was really hard. I got a phone call from Collingwood, um, the coach, the the um, football manager, the president at the time. And they basically said, look, we want you to come and play. Um, this is the contract. We, we think we get done a deal with, with Fitzroy. And so I flew back to Australia. I was really disappointed in the club. It's disappointed in Fitzroy. And then uh, to come trade time, Collingwood couldn't get any of the Fitzroy players to go. Um, sorry, any of the Collingwood players to go to, to Fitzroy. Um, and the trade didn't go through. So it was, it was then me ringing the footy club. I still hadn't heard from anyone at the footy club. And I was extremely disappointed. I rang the club and I said, look, what do you want to do now? And they said, oh, we're going to honour your contract. And I said, well, I'm heading back to the States. I said, that's fine. Um, so I got back to America and I thought, well, if you don't want me as a player, you probably don't want me as captain. So I resigned the captaincy that year. And, you know, yeah, it was a really tough period. I was really shocked by the footy club and the way they, um, you know, responded to me as, as captain of the club. And, yeah, um, I stayed a number of years because the, the, the president at the time left and the new president came in and, yeah, he apologised and said, look, we want you to stay. And I lasted a few more years before I left to go to Sydney. Yeah, that sounds like a really difficult time. How do you think, looking back at the Fitzroy and Brisbane merge, how do you think it has gone? Well, I think they've done the best they possibly could. I, I remember back in 1986, about seven weeks to go before the season finished, we were told that Fitzroy was going to fold or we we're going to relocate to Brisbane. So that was back in 86. And all the players voted to stay together. All the players voted we want to go to Brisbane together. And then a company, I think, called Hecron came in and bailed the club out. So ever since that time, it was really, really difficult. Um, club struggled for money. The VFL then didn't really get behind the footy club. So I think when the merge eventually happened, it was really the best case scenario that they could have come up with. And I think the way the club's done it, the way the Brisbane Lions have embraced it, you know, which was the Brisbane Brears, I think they've really tried to do it. And they've tried the best they possibly could. And I know they've tried to embrace the old Fitzroy history. And I've been to back to a number of different functions and been to the games. And I remember going to the 201 Grand Final and the great mate Lynch was playing. And I was working for Channel 7 at the time. And I was actually on the field when uh, they won the won the premiership. And I went onto the ground. And then I worked back, walked back to the hotel. And all the Fitzroy people saying, Bruzy, that's great. What a great day. And well done. And thanks for everything you did. So, yeah, look, it, it was sort of tough. And I know some people, Fitzroy people, find it really difficult. But as an ex-Fitzroy player, you know, I think I think the Brisbane Lions have done an amazing job to embrace the history and have continued to do that over time. And I take my head off to them. And I think it's, a, you know, it's the best that they could have come up with under the circumstances. Yeah, it's really uh, good that they are continuing to embrace the history of Fitzroy. So who would have been the best player that you played with at either... Fitzroy or Sydney and why? Yeah, probably the two best players I played with at Fitzroy were Bernie Quinlan and Gary Wilson. Um, yeah, look, Bernie was won a Brownlow medal as a ruck rover and then went to full forward and kicked over 100 goals on a couple of occasions. I mean, he's, he was just an exceptional athlete, but a great footballer as well and really good person. Gary Wilson was a sort of five foot 11 rover and there was nothing he couldn't do. He could mark the ball. He could kick it, handball. He was tough. He was hard. He was fit. He was quick. Um, he was just an exceptional player and, again, a great person. And then, yeah, I was very fortunate to play with the great Tony Lockett when I went to Sydney and Tony Lockett and Paul Kelly as well. So they're probably the top four players. So, I mean, Tony Lockett, 
you know, he was obviously a great full forward, big and strong and tough, but his skill level was just elite. His ability to, to you know, snap goals and at training, you know, just marvelled at his, his skills at training. And Paul Kelly, just his combination of speed, strength, stamina, toughness. Um, he was an exceptional player as well. So they're probably the four best players I've got a chance to play with. Yeah, they're all fantastic players. What was the biggest lesson that you learned whilst uh, you worked in the AFL industry? I think that just the, just the discipline and the teamwork, you know, like there's no doubt, I think anyone that's been involved at the AFL level and in a team sport, that just the teamwork, the camaraderie. When you get a team like 2005 winning a premiership, you know, with perhaps not the most talented team, you know, but everyone working together and putting their egos aside, you know, knowing their role, playing their role, um, working for each other. I think that's the greatest thing that I've learned out of sport. You know, if you can get a group of footballers to do it, um, to be selfless and to help each other, um, anyone can do it. Providing you put the effort in, you put the time in, you create standards, you create behaviours, and you have great leaders that are role models. You know, I think that's the other thing. You know, if you're a leader in any form of life, you have to be first and foremost a, a role model. And don't do anything you're not going to ask anyone else to do. And I think that's a big part of it as well. Yeah, it definitely is. So what was it like to be the coach of the Sydney Swans when you broke the 72-year uh, premiership drought in 2005? Yeah, it was incredible. It was unbelievable. Um, probably the biggest thing was, yeah, the amount of effort that had gone into it, not just the people that we... Um, you had in 2005, not just the players or, you know, support staff of that year, the amount of people and time that went into it for, for 72 years, I mean, it was a huge build up, the sacrifices the players made to leave, you know, South Melbourne in, in the early 80s and the amount of money that people put in in the mid 80s and, you know, the, the, the private ownership. I think that was the thing that hit home and to be the coach at that particular time and to coach with a great bunch of coaches, to coach a great bunch of players. It was just incredible. So that, yeah, it was, it was really uh, an amazing experience, which I still look back on with fondness and still talk to those people that were involved, you know, with great pride that they were part of it and we were part of it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Would have it been the best uh, success in your coaching career? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of different successes in Melbourne, there's some really great successes there to come from a, such a low base. And, you know, the year before I got to Melbourne to win two games and then to finish in the, my last year winning 10 and, you know, beating Hawthorne, the MCG, I think, in the latter part of my last season was amazing. But, yeah, winning a premiership is just the ultimate success. Um, but there's certainly been a lot of great successes along the way. And, you know, some of the success we had at Melbourne in that time and some of the development of the players and, you know, the club and, you know, the supporters and seeing, yeah, you know, even after I left, two years after I left playing, you know, Melbourne, watching them play in the grand, the, the, sorry, the finals two years ago was amazing, you know, just to see the smiles on the face of the players and the fans and the supporters. So, yeah, been really fortunate to have a lot of great success and a lot of great memories from my time as coaching both Sydney and the Melbourne Football Club. Yeah, you definitely had a fantastic coaching career. What would have been the hardest part of being an AFL coach? Um, I think the hardest part is probably the scrutiny and probably the fact that, as, as you know, as, as much the media knows, is they never really know what's going in on side of the footy club. So, yeah, and the media are the conduit between the club and the supporters. So when you get a media, you know, that don't really understand everything that's going on and misreport so many things, that, that probably that becomes the hardest thing because... Yeah, then the fans believe it, everyone believes it, and yeah, it's actually not really true. Um, so then it's just a distraction and you've got to continually deal with those distractions and deal with things that are outside your control. And then yeah, you bunker down inside your footy club. So that's probably the hardest thing is just dealing with external, you know, um, um, you know, smokes and mirrors that aren't really true. And you just have to deal with them as best you possibly can and shield your club from it. And as a coach, you just got to deal with it as best you possibly can. Yeah, so earlier this month, you had an interview with Triple M talking about how the media can better support senior coaches. Can you give us some insight into this? 
Yeah, look, I've had a number of discussions with some media people. As you know, I've been in the media for a while, not doing anything this year. But to me, it's always a two a double edged sword. It can't be one way. Yeah, you can't have the media just you know terrorising someone like Ross Lyon and then expecting something in return. And I, I think the media at times have completely overstepped the mark and then they expect something back from the footy clubs or the players. And it just doesn't, it can't work like that. You know, if you work collectively together, and I think I said in that interview that play, coaches and players understand if we're played badly or coached badly, that's open slather. You know, that's just part of what we do. But when you bring external things into it, and you speculate on things that aren't true. And then all of a sudden you come back to the club and say, yeah, by the way, can we get um, Paul Roos to do an interview or can we get Barry Hall to do an interview or Nathan Jones? And then to wonder why the club doesn't really want to support the media. Um, the reason they don't want to support the media is because they don't see the media supporting the club. Now, that's not to say the media doesn't play a role in holding clubs accountable, holding coaches accountable, holding players accountable. They absolutely do. But I think it is time where we need to come up with a collective set of behaviours and say, well, look, yeah, this is, this is what the media's role is. Um, and in return, this is what the, the players will provide and this is what the clubs will provide. Um, but at the moment, it's very blurred. And I think the media, you know, certainly overstepped the mark in a lot of different areas. Yeah, no, it is really important. Do you think that there needs to be a greater focus on coaches and players' mental health? I think internally it is. I mean, the clubs are very, very good at looking after their players. Probably the coaches' association now are starting to work that out for the coaches. And it's almost when the coaches leave the game. But, and I also think it's individual responsibility as well. I mean, it, I, you know, I was a coach and, you know, I, I took individual responsibility to meditate every day and to go for a run to eat pretty healthy. So, yeah, you can't abdicate your own responsibility as a coach too. So, you know, it's a complicated... Um, process but there's individual responsibility there's club responsibility there's support mechanisms that are in place but there's more that needs to be done there's no question about that yeah that's uh, really important what would have been your favorite afl game to commentate um probably the richmond giants prelim final um like it was just amazing and i think of myself and dermot and brownie jonathan brown were doing it and I remember at the end of the game, I had never been to a game and it was a preliminary final, obviously, you know, it was a home game for Richmond, but the Giants not having as many supporters as, you know, Melbourne-based clubs, it was, you know, 95,000 Richmond supporters and 5,000 Giants supporters. And I remember all three of us had our mobile, mobile phones out after the game and we not, none of us had seen anything like it before, where basically the whole crowd was supporting one team and the, the atmosphere was just extraordinary. So that was probably something that was, you know, really special to be a part of, sitting on that platform at the MCG on the, on the pocket there down at one end and the city end and the siren went and then the Richmond supporters just going absolutely crazy. So it was sort of hard to go past that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that this year, as we know, there probably won't be crowds at games. Do you think that will affect teams in the finals and just playing in general? Yeah, I, I think you have to go back to round one. And I, I think we're all a bit shocked at how much the crowd meant to the game. And, you know, I remember saying to a lot of people that gee, the game looked like a practice game. It didn't look like a proper AFL game of football. And I guess that's that 10 or 15% of the energy levels that the crowd brings to the game that brings the the intensity of the, you know, the tackling and the defensive side and, you know, the ebbs and flows of the game. And, yeah, it's going to be a different game. I think we know that from round one. We're not going to get the intensity that we've had in the past. And hopefully we get crowds back by finals time and grand finals time because there's no doubt it's a different game, 100%. And it will have a major impact on, um, yeah, particularly when you're playing at interstate venues. You know, I remember talking to the Melbourne players they played at West Coast round one and it was just completely different to when they played over there last year and the year before and, and vice versa with other clubs. So it is going to have a massive impact and it does detract from the games, no question. Yeah, it definitely uh, will. Do you think that the AFL will implement a canned crowd noise? Yeah, I'm not sure. It's probably not a bad idea because 
Um, I mean, the, for the players, it's so unique. You know, it's so unusual to go. It is like a training. I mean, it's like a training drill, you know, when you're playing in front of no one. So, you know, I don't know whether it works with crowd noise or whatever, but certainly we do know without the crowds, the game, the quality of the game is not as high as what it used to be. So, yeah, whatever you can do to deliver a great product to the people watching at home, I'm sure the AFL and the clubs will try everything they possibly can to do it to deliver a great product for the, for the fans at home. Yeah, the crowds are really important. Who do you think are the top five uh, best players in the AFL currently? Yeah, it's, a, it's hard to say. There's so many. I mean, look, Dusty Martin is a fantastic player. Um, you know, you look at Paddy Dangerfield, is an amazing player. Um, you know, I still think, you know, someone like a Scotty Pendlebury is, is right up there in terms of how good he is. Um, yeah, I love um, Stephen Keneally. I think he's become a, an incredible player as well. And obviously Nate Fife. For the for the Frio Dockers, so it's hard to sort of rank them, um, but you know you've you've got some amazing players in the competition now. Martin Bond and Pelly become a great player. I mean, you could list you know twenty players to thirty players and throw a blanket over them because yeah, there's so many good players running around the AFL at the moment. Yeah, there are there are some fantastic players. How have you been spending your time away from working in the AFL industry? Yeah, well, I was due to be going overseas in the next week. So, obviously, part of stepping away, you know, this is only my second year out of footy since I started in 1980. So, yeah, it was going to be pretty exciting not to be involved and to get over to Europe and spend five weeks over there and do some travelling and do some of the things that I haven't been able to do. So, clearly, with the virus, we haven't been able to do that. So, yeah, look, spending time at home and I guess a lot for me is I love the leadership space and just watching, observing leadership and leaders around the world, leaders in Australia, leaders of industry, leaders of countries, leaders of states, and really just observing a lot, looking after myself, doing a lot of meditation, doing some exercise, making sure I'm looking after myself and helping as many people as I possibly can and reaching out as possibly as much as I possibly can as well. Yeah, that is really important to stay connected, but also look after your well-being. So uh, do you think that Paul, we will see a lot more injuries when football returns on June 11. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've been speaking to a lot of coaches and fitness staff over the last week, and I think that's the expectation. I mean, the expectation is that we'll see a lot of injuries, yeah, and certainly in the first five, four or five weeks. And I think players and clubs and are preparing for that. Now, how you can prepare for it, I'm not sure, but I think it's just a case of making sure, you know, your, your list is deep, everyone's ready to play. Um, there's no doubt you're going to lose a lot of players through calf injuries, hamstring injuries, groin injuries, quad injuries, because you can't, you simply can't prepare for an AFL season with four weeks of training and, and certainly two weeks of contact work. It's just impossible to do it and expect players to turn up and be at the absolute best. So, you, you know, a lot of it's going to be getting ready to play by playing. So around one, two, three, four and five are going to be really interesting. But you're going to watch a lot of players go down, a lot of players getting injured and then younger players coming in and having to play their role. So teams that are well prepared, you know, got deep lists, got experienced players ready to play are going to do well in the first, you know, six to eight weeks of the season. Yeah, it will be really interesting to see how it unfolds. Do you think that the fact that AFL players aren't allowed to play in, well, in general, AFL players can't play in the state league competitions, do you think that will have an effect on are the players that come into the AFL with the players that go out injured? Oh, 100%. I was just with a couple of players, um, ex-teammates of mine, one still involved in the footy club. And, yeah, we just spoke about it then. It's going to have a huge effect. You know, the, the inability of everyone to play every single week. You know, how do you get those young players prepared? How do you pick a team when you get injuries? It has huge ramifications to the season. There's no question about it. You know, the ability to develop players in lower levels and get them ready to play. And, and even longer term, you're going to have players that will get cut at the end of the year that won't have any football this year, which is so unfair on those particular players. So the season is going to be dramatically different and really having no VFL, no feeder comps is going to have a huge effect on the competition. Yeah, it really will. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, for your time today. It has been fantastic 
uh, to have you as a part of the Footy with Fletch podcast. All the best. Thanks, mate. That was fantastic. Good on you. So there we have it. Uh, the Footy with Fletch podcast episode three it was fantastic to have the great Paul Ruse on my podcast. He gave us a lot of insight into some of the big issues that are currently surrounding the AFL industry, but also talking about his early life, his playing career and coaching career. So it was great to have Rusey on the show. Thank you for listening to episode three of Footy with Fletch. I can't wait for episode four. Bye for now.